Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. America's game. A countdown of the 20 greatest Super Bowl champions. And now, number seven. There are two categories of Super Bowl participants that nobody remembers. One, the team that lost the game, and two, the team that only won one. For some, the Super Bowl is an ending. For the Pittsburgh Steelers, Super Bowl IX was a beginning. Pittsburgh, the Super Bowl champ. Chuck Noll being carried off. They're still a very young team. I would say their best years are ahead of them. A team that may not have even reached its peak. And the future opponents are going to have some trouble. Head coach Chuck Noll began preparing the Steelers for the 1975 season and their second Super Bowl about 10 minutes after winning their first. I think we're going to uh, enjoy it uh, for just a short time and then get on to next year. And then be ready for next season. All right? <laughs> That's right. It comes around fast. Chuck Noel addressed the team, but he left the hanging message. You can do better, and we can be better, and let's work, okay, for next year's championship. I was kind of stunned because it was something you would typically maybe expect a day or two later or next summer. But Chuck was never a person to let a moment go by. He considered that Super Bowl nothing more than a road sign. OK, we've gotten this far, but we want to keep on going. Nearly every player on the Pittsburgh roster had been drafted and developed under Noel. So it was little surprise that the players, like their coach, would not be satisfied with merely one ring. Just ask Glenn Swan if he remembers how many passes he caught in that first Super Bowl. I do. Uh, the same number that were thrown to me. Zero. <laughs> I was dying to get Terry to throw me a pass, a play-action pass. I think it would have gone for a touchdown. But I couldn't get him to throw me that one play-action pass, and so I went the entire game without one pass being thrown to me. But we won, and that was the most important thing. Defensive end Dwight White wasn't supposed to play in Super Bowl IX after spending a week in the hospital with viral pneumonia and losing 20 pounds. Yet, when the first bus arrived at Tulane Stadium, Dwight White was in the locker room getting dressed, getting ready to play a football game. White played the entire game. He even scored its first points on a safety. It was a courageous performance and one for which White still feels unappreciated because he did not appear in the official Super Bowl team photo taken while he was hospitalized. That's a real raw spot with me because um, I, just, I just thought that that was a, you know, a, a real insult, you know? I mean, you look at the picture, I'm not in the picture. They did not even put my name on the photo and say that I was missing. And I'm the I had to get out of the hospital, you know, and scored the first point. That pissed me off. This was a team loaded with big personalities. And Chuck Noll waded through all of them. 
Some people say, well, you know, he was a teacher. I didn't look at it that way. I thought he was a great manager. I mean, he was able to keep all those personalities on the same page. We, as players, learned very early on that Chuck had these little expressions, because Chuck was very consistent. The things he said in 71, he was still saying in 80. He had these things, you haven't arrived yet. If you think you've arrived, you haven't. Don't dissipate what you've accomplished this week. Don't waste the weight. The thing is, we're not, I don't think anybody's really a fat cat on our team, or they're going to uh, lay down and say, Hey, you know, I'm the world's champ. Uh, they're too concerned about tomorrow. Uh, I think we're tomorrow people. We're not today people and yesterday people. And... Tomorrow people means that if you're satisfied with what you're doing now or what you did yesterday, then you're going to fail. Okay, so you'd say, be a tomorrow person. That's a quote from uh, Chuck Knoll, but I think it's, uh, it's a good uh, analogy. <laughs> Yes, I guess I'm brainwashed, particularly at that point in time. <laughs> Maybe I had a concussion, I don't know. But uh, Chuck, Chuck obviously had some influence on me and the rest of the team with his expressions. You know, you can't argue with success. We had a lot of success believing in that stuff and listening to that propaganda. You can never please him is what it comes down to. But at the end of the day, you go home and think about it. That's what it's about. Why should you be pleased? I'm going to be pleased when I retire. I'm going to be pleased, like right now, when I'm talking about something that happened 30 years ago and turned out well. Okay, that's what he was talking about. Never were Knowles' words more valuable than in 1975, when the Steelers took the field as champions and began their ascent into legend. For the first time in their four-decade history, the Pittsburgh Steelers were the NFL's defending champions as the 1975 season began. There was a realization on that team that all the things that Chuck, the Roonies, had built had come to fruition. We were a championship team, and we had the core of that right there. We didn't have to prove it. We'd already done it. And now we could just go out and relax and be, just be. We knew the team could run, we could pass, we could stop a team. We just knew we could put it together. And we went out there and proved it each week. That second year was more fun because of that confidence. After crushing San Diego in the opener, the Steelers returned home to face the Buffalo Bills and O.J. Simpson. Chuck had told us that we did not play a very good game against San Diego, yet we dominated. And I think our team kind of nodded, yeah, yeah, coach, right? We hear that all the time. We know we're good. And we're going to go out and we're going to show you again in week two that we're good. Well, guess what? Uh, O.J. had a different idea. O.J. rushed for 227 yards, the most the Steelers defense had ever allowed. Well, you know, this, this, this happens. You know? <laughs> They beat us soundly in that ball game. It taught us a lesson early on. There was a bullseye on our back. Every team was going to play us a little bit tougher, and it was a matter of pride. I don't know how we lost the game, why we lost the game, but what I do know that whoever's on deck the next week, you're in deep, 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 you know what. Steelers might have been wearing the bullseye, but usually they were the team taking target practice. You're going to have a bad day today. Now, you can take this ass with me any way you want to take it, but you're going to take it. After the loss to Buffalo, they won their next three games by a total of 78 points. You know, you have to continue to improve to hold the same ground. And in order to get back to the Super Bowl, we realized during the course of the season in the Buffalo game that we had to elevate our game just to reach the same place. Elevation was always the name of the game for Lynn Swan. Bradshaw stops short, throws high into the end zone on the near side. Cut by Lynn Swan. Swan has made another sensational catch. In 1974, his rookie year, Swan caught 11 passes. In 75, he scored 11 touchdowns. I saw Lynn play in college. I watched him on TV. Wow, look at this kid. 
He can play football. And we drafted him. I said, this is going to be really interesting. This kid's All-American. This kid's number one draft pick. But he hasn't played against us. Here we go. And you come to Steeler Camp back then, it's live. God bless whoever was the offensive coordinator. They decide to run Lynn on an in route. Sure enough, one of our defensive backs just pounds him. You know, we're like vultures. We're kind of walking around, seeing if he's going to get up or not, you know. And he gets up. We go, okay, that's good. Next day, new rule. Steeler defensive backs in training camp are no longer allowed to tackle receivers or drive them to the ground. We're going, oh, this is the Lynn Swan rule. To Lynn's credit, he wouldn't care. He would have run over the middle, full contact, which he did for his whole career. He turned out to be that kind of player. He, yeah, he's 5'11", 180 pounds, but he can jump through a roof and he'll take a hit. The public doesn't realize that. They think, oh, how graceful he is. He's a swan. You look at his name. Lynn would stick his nose in there. He's like a prize fighter. My job is to go out and catch the ball. And as a receiver, if I want to be effective and good, I cannot go out and worry who's behind me when the ball's in the air. He could have played on our defense. Nobody was more pleased that he played on the offense than Terry Bradshaw, whose early years in the NFL had been a struggle. We'd go in and, and the, the uh, Tuesday after the game on Sunday, and the defensive reel would be this big. The offensive reel would be about that big, you know, because they were three and out. And Bradshaw was terrible. He was bad. The emergence of Swan and fellow second-year receiver John Stallworth, number 82, was transforming the Steelers and their quarterback. A, a quarterback has to have a certain level of confidence that his receivers are going to make a play. And I think Bradshaw was there, uh, that he felt like he could put the ball out there and we could make a play. Long ball, far side, there goes Swan, double coverage, he takes it for a touchdown. The offensive reel started getting bigger, and the defensive reel started getting smaller. And the Super Bowl champions kept getting better. Bradshaw back looking for Swan. There it goes. He takes it. Oh, was that a beauty. 1975 was the first time in the Super Bowl era that three teams from the same division won at least 10 games. The Steelers, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Houston Oilers. The most pivotal stretch of the regular season came in week seven and eight, when the Steelers faced both of their division rivals. First up were the undefeated Bengals. And Cincinnati was emerging as a, as a pretty formidable opponent. They hadn't been real good, but they had this guy, Kenny Anderson. Kenny Anderson and the Bengals offense posed a unique challenge. He was one of these guys that if you could ever get a bead on him, you could get to him. But it was the one, two, drop, boom. And he just dinked us all the time. We could never get to this guy. Yeah, I think some guy named Walsh had something to do with that. Eventually, assistant coach Bill Walsh left Paul Brown's Bengals and took his little offense to the West Coast. In the meantime, it was the Steelers' offense that shined. Two Lin Swan touchdowns helped the Steelers open a 20-point lead. Two Mike Wagner interceptions held off a fourth-quarter comeback. Oh, there he's firing. And it picks off on Mike Wagner inside the 20, out of the 25, the 30, the 35, the 40. Wagner picks it off, and Wagner could well have saved the day. One first-place showdown led to another. A week later, the 6-1 Steelers hosted the 6-1 Oilers. With the game tied in the final minutes, the Steelers took their place atop the division. Bradshaw looking for the end zone, and there he is, wide open on the far side, Johnny Stallworth takes 
Watson for the touchdown. Stallworth, second year man from Alabama AM. If there's one statement that I think broadly applies to that 75 year, we knew what it took at that point and think Chuck had a statement, whatever it takes. And we bought into that. We bought into it big time. Of all his little sayings, whatever it takes was Chuck Knoll's favorite. That was a um, uh, comment that used to pop out at least every couple weeks. He might throw that out, whatever it takes to motivate us, or he also might use it as an explanation. Chuck was always really kind of short with the media, like, well, whatever it takes. In 1975, it would take a nearly perfect regular season just to win the division. Running back Franco Harris led the way, rushing for more yards than anyone but O.J. Simpson. The Steelers scored more points, gave up fewer, and won more games than they did in 74 their first Super Bowl season. It's an interesting intangible, and I don't know what it is, but it was there. The attitude and the optimism and the determination, you could feel it, you could see it in everybody's eyes. We were gonna find some way to win. It was just like, we got business to do, let's get it done. Together, the Oilers and Bengals went 21-3 and against the rest of the NFL. Against the Steelers, they went 0-4. Pittsburgh dominated both rematches. Gives it to Franco, straight through the middle. Franco to the end zone. They don't even knock him down. The Steelers won 11 straight games, finishing with a 12-2 record in the AFC Central Division title. And the give is to move. He was nailed. He's fumbled the football and his loose. No blood scoops it up. He doesn't hold it. Now it's picked up. Now the floor lamber goes with the ladder. Is the ball off? The ball is being carried for a touchdown by JT Thomas. You look at that era, you look at Cincinnati and Houston, and I sometimes think it's really a shame that they hadn't won a championship, but we were in their way. In 1971, the Steelers selected Mike Wagner, a safety from Western Illinois University in the 11th round of the NFL draft. Wagner's ambitions were modest. You know, if I can make the taxi squad the first year and maybe by my third year I might be a starter, you know, and kind of plod this out like I was taking college courses and all of a sudden I'm starting my rookie year and being thrown at it. It was a shock. Injuries forced Wagner, number 23, into the starting lineup in the first game of his rookie season. He remained there for the rest of the decade, intercepting 36 passes and quarterbacking the secondary of maybe the finest defense in pro football history. No one had a better view of the great steel curtain than Mike Wagner. There's two definitions of the Steel Curtain. First of all, you need to clarify. I think the front four would say we are the Steel Curtain. The Steel Curtain is LC, Joe Green, Ernie Holmes, and yours truly. And that's, that's something that uh, it's in the book. You can't change it. You can't deny it. That's what it was. Other defensive lines had gotten acclaim, such as the Purple People Leaders. But there was something that was very unique and obviously unique about us in that we were four black players. Coming out of the late 60s and the movements and, the, you know, the sociology in the country, that was something that was important and we took a lot of pride in. That here are four black cats that are on the cover of Time magazine. So we were very much aware of what we had going. And um, we were very proud of that. The defensive line was the most unique line in that none of the players were similar, but they played so well as a unit. You had this tall, rangy defensive end, L.C. Greenwood, who was about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, and people couldn't block him. 
Joe Green was magical. He could have played defensive back. And while Joe was obviously going to be a Hall of Famer, one guy that was as good, I thought, was Ernie Holmes. This guy was like the uh, closest thing to a John Deere tractor I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he just actually was unstoppable. Here was a football player that I think brought fear in other players because he had a look to him that was really, really scary. And I think he really wanted to beat people to death sometimes, okay, within the rules of the game. Ernie Holmes wasn't even the nasty one. That would be Dwight White. I think you certainly look to his nickname, and it tells the whole story. His nickname was Mad Dog. <laughs> Dwight was the consummate player who said, I'm going to go 100%, 1,000 miles an hour, every play. I'm going to make life miserable for everybody in my way. I'm going to hit it hard, and you just make sure you get outside, because I'm coming, I'm hitting, that, I'm hitting it like a bitch. It was my idea to just keep coming. Just constant, constant pressure. I'm going to keep pounding on you. I guess I played with a little anger, too. I got for you, Dougie, you big load. I'm a push leader. I personalized the game. He was always something was stimulating him to be outspoken. Sack pack is a sack of you know what. <laughs> and it made him play harder. We had a few players like that on that team. No player was more outspoken than the team's second round pick in the 74 draft, Jack Lambert. Lambert's difficult, period, with anybody. I can't tell you that Jack and I are the best of friends. I remember he came in the locker room, it's towards the end of our rookie season, and Jack just stopped for a moment, and he looked at me and he goes, hey, Swan. I look up and I go, yeah, Jack, what's up? He goes, you should have been number two. I should have been number one. And he just walked away. He was a type of player that had to challenge himself, his teammates, his opponents at all time to make him play better. And that's what made him who he is. That is who he is. Lambert was just one third of a linebacking core, every bit as good as the foursome in front of it. In 75, all three started in the Pro Bowl. Lambert, Andy Russell, number 34, Jack Ham, number 59. In all, eight of the Steelers' 11 defensive starters made the Pro Bowl. Cornerback Mel Blunt, number 47, who led the NFL with 11 interceptions, was voted team MVP. There was a game, I remember one game, I did not have to make a tackle. I was a strong safety to run support. I didn't have to make a tackle the whole game on a running play. I, I think I only fell down like three times the whole day. I wanted to play football. I wanted to hit people. I wanted to be involved in plays. It was like the team was so good sometime in front of me that I was envious. Everybody wanted to make the play, but they were disciplined to realize that it's a team defense. I don't want to offend Dwight. <laughs> And Ernie and, and, and Joe, by assuming that uh, that I don't respect their Steel Curtain name, but I think we uh, we all are the, the Steel Curtain. Tomorrow night, the countdown continues. He's everyone on a cool crisp December day at the AFC semifinal game between the defending world champion Pittsburgh Steelers and the Eastern Division champion Baltimore Colts. The Steelers didn't look like defending champions. They turned the ball over five times and trailed the Colts late in third quarter. It was really kind of an interesting phenomenon I felt that we could be in close games but sure enough, someone would make big plays in the fourth quarter. And it is intercepted, picked off at the 25. Here comes Bell Blunt. So the outcome would end up in our favor. And off. Gary Baraki fly off the right side. Second effort down into the goal line. He's in there for a touchdown. Right on cue, the Steelers took over the game. 
and right on cue, the big play sealed it. A fake by Jones, ball knocked out of his hands, picked up by the Steelers. Andy picked up that ball, took off, looked like he was going to sprint to the end zone, and the bear just got on his back. He was getting slower and slower. Sports Illustrated called it the longest, slowest touchdown ever witnessed. I was on the ground when Andy got the ball. I caught Andy, passed him, and blocked for him. <laughs> the guy was running like a 39 Chrysler, you know? Burt Jones was actually blocked three times on that one play. He gets blocked, he gets up, he catches Andy, he gets blocked and knocked down again. He gets up, goes after Andy, and gets blocked a third time by the time Andy Russell gets to the end zone. Great football teams find a way to win even when they're not playing their best. That playoff game was like that. We know we can play cup combined football. We know uh, we can pretty much stop any team in the league. And it's just a matter now see if we can continue to do it. The next opponent was a familiar one. For the fourth straight season, the Steelers would meet the Oakland Raiders in the playoffs. It was a rivalry already etched in NFL lore, and it was escalating every year. In 72, the Steelers won. In 73, the Raiders returned the favor. And in 74, the Steelers clinched their first trip to the Super Bowl on the Raiders' home field. The Raiders were a good football team. They were a darn good football team. When I look back and really think about it, they were the closest things to us. Those games were just tough games. You started getting revved up and cranked up and putting your mouthpiece in on Monday. They were our arch enemy. Lynn Swan had been a target for the silver and black since the moment he donned the black and gold. They were going to take shots. We knew that. Um, why? Uh, I don't know. If it was something they were taught, if it was just in the mind of the players, I don't know. I don't think I was totally prepared for the head hunting. Uh, matter of fact, I know I wasn't. I didn't think it would get to that degree or to that level, uh, but it did. There would be one more subplot to the AFC championship game, the sub-freezing field conditions. The weather had been bitter the whole week in Pittsburgh. It had snowed, and they had actually put a big tarp over the field and tented it. And I guess the night before, it split or something. And because it split, all this moisture from the uh, heaters underneath it had run to the side, and it became an ice skating rink. Most of the ice was near the sidelines. And the ever-skeptical Raiders have always felt that the Steelers, intentionally or not, created an unfair home field advantage. Our game was the throwing, the deep ball. Mel Blunt, if there's one play he dreaded, it was Clifford Branch. So with that ice, we had to move those receivers in, and that narrowed the field for us. I'll never forget Pete Rosell said to me, well, it's the same for both sides. I said, damn it, Pete, you don't even understand what you're talking about. It's not the same for both sides. I don't even want to hear it. That's, that's, that's uh, excuses, excuses. Pretty tough, huh? Pretty tough. Yeah. They threw a lot of chemicals on the field. It was about 10 degrees. The wind was blowing about 30 miles an hour. To me, that game had as much drama as a Super Bowl. It was one of my favorite games that I was ever involved in. It was a championship game unlike any other. The NFL's two toughest teams doing battle on a sheet of ice. It was very hard to uh, throw the ball accurately. It was very hard to f hold on the ball. Your hands were numb. You know, th there was balls being dropped, being fumbled, uh, being intercepted, being bobbled all day. The Steelers and the Raiders scored a total of three points in the first three quarters. As predicted, Oakland's outside passing game was rendered useless. 
but the futility was everywhere. The two teams combined for 13 turnovers, eight by the Steelers. The most heated rivalry in the NFL was stuck in a deep freeze. This is not going to be easy, gentlemen. This is, going, this is a dog fight. Last man standing type of thing. The rivalry had escalated for four years. Now it was escalating on every play. Came across the middle for a pass. I caught the pass. Uh, Atkinson, instead of just a tackle, collared me around the head, which was legal at that time. Fumbled the football, and then I was out. I was out of the ball game and in the locker room, and later on, uh, you know, in an ambulance going to the hospital. I have a picture at home uh, where Joe Green, uh, with his pinched nerve, gets off the bench, picked me up, and was carrying me off the field. Uh, his bad shoulder couldn't handle the weight. One leg was dangling, but he carried me off the field, and I've got that picture of Joe. I gave him a copy of the picture and signed it and said, Joe, thank you for coming out and picking me up. And Joe just looked at me and said, you know, Swanee, that's fine, but, you know, I just want you to understand, I didn't want the team to waste a time out <laughs> to get you off the field. At the 25, with the snowflakes falling again, Bradshaw to Harris, can't find the hole inside, goes outside to the left, breaks a tackle, he's still at 20 down the sideline, he's going to go for a Pittsburgh touchdown, Franco Harris, he gallops 25 yards into the end zone for a Pittsburgh touchdown, the first TD of the afternoon. Franco bounced a, a run outside, and it looked like the Raiders were going to bottle it up, and Somehow, Johnny Stallworth, I think he laid one or two Raiders out. Yeah, Franco scored the touchdown, but it, it was all because of Johnny Stallworth's effort. John made a great block. Cody? No, Stallworth. Oh, did he? Stallworth also made a great catch. Bradshaw is back to pass. They're coming after him. Gets away, and now he throws to the end zone. Look out! It is caught! The defensive back goes down on the turf. With less than a minute to play, the Raiders drew to within six. Nobody ever went to bed on a Raider game, okay? Hey, at least not in Pittsburgh. It's never in the bag with, with the Raiders. On the final play, Kenny Stabler looked for Cliff Branch down the icy sideline. And Mel tackled him. And I think I was sitting on my butt just going, oh, thank God, thank God. And it was over. Steelers had committed an astonishing 13 turnovers in two home playoff games and won both. They were back in the Super Bowl. Whatever it takes. America's Game is brought to you by IBM. What makes you special? For the first time, the Super Bowl matched two teams that had already won Lombardi trophies. Let's go, Joe. Let's go, Chief, baby. The pregame talk centered on the health of Lynn Swan. I did not think I was going to be able to play. Uh, I was certainly unsure. It never sustained a concussion of that level. You know, I was in the hospital, I think, for two or three days. Wasn't catching the ball extremely well at practice. Frankly, my confidence was a little bit low. And the doctors essentially left it up to me as to whether or not I felt like I could play the game. And later on in the week, I, I picked up an article 
and Cliff Harris makes a comment about how physical the Dallas Cowboys are. And that ticked me off. Nobody can tell me I can't play this game. And so uh, I took the challenge. Swan was not the only Steeler who would be challenged. But Staubach, the quarterback, taking the ball, faking, he's back to throw. Staubach, straight down to the open man at the 15. He's coming to the 10. He's down to the 5. Touchdown, Dallas Cowboys. And Staubach hit Drew Pearson. The Cowboys scored on a play which we had studied. And I said, geez, I think this play is going to happen. This is a formation, and I'm trying to check out of it. And it was very noisy, so I wasn't comfortable that everybody was getting the check. So being a safety, I decided to play it safe, and I just backed up. Mike Wagner's cautious decision resulted in the only first quarter touchdown allowed by the Steelers all season. And as I went to the sidelines, I just said, oh, shoot. I said, that was the play, you know, screwed up. If they do this again, I I'm not going to hesitate. I'm going to go. The most important thing to me when I stepped onto the field was to make the first catch. I had to make that catch. I don't care where the ball was, I had to catch it. And back goes Bradshaw to fire to the near side and to face the interception. They beat was Lynn Swan, and they rule a good catch at the Dallas 16 yard line as Swan beats the defensive back Mark Washington on a great play. That sideline catch, I was actually looking down. And I'm going, how do you do that? How do you do that? Yeah, it, it probably in all rights, it shouldn't have been thrown to me. Uh, Mark Washington, number 46, excellent coverage, excellent position. Once I had that catch under my belt, I was back in the ball game. Swan's soaring catch was a work of art. His levitating leap was a masterpiece. You plan for some things and other things you don't plan for. Mark Washington had great coverage throughout the entire afternoon, but I found a way to make the catches and found a way to make the plays. And we needed it. At the end of the day, we needed him to play that kind of game because the Cowboys were that good. We didn't play them very often, and they ran a different type of offense than we were customary to. The Cowboys run a lot of motion and set changes. Y'all, that's smoke and mirrors, OK? There's a rule that one second before the ball is snapped, everybody's got to be in place. So you can run around, do all the stuff you want to do. You can run him up in the stands. You can go get a Gatorade. But we know where you're going to end up, and we're going to be looking right at you. The Steelers had never seen an offense quite like the Cowboys. But the Cowboys had never seen a defense like the Steel Curtain. The Steelers sacked Roger Stahlbach seven times and dominated the game. left a deeper impression on Dallas than Jack Lambert. Trailing 10-7 in the third quarter, the Steelers missed a field goal. When Cowboys safety Cliff Harris taunted kicker Roy Jarella, Lambert responded. I thought that was right on time, and I'm glad Lambert did that. I think the message sent was thunderous. No one's going to intimidate any of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And if you don't understand that, we're going to show you that. It can help further define what Pittsburgh Steeler football Jack Lambert is all about. It was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And I don't know what Cliff was thinking. Two mistakes, uh, one pregame, <laughs> one during the game. Wagner did not make a second mistake. They get in this formation. They start running these uh, motions. You know, I said, damn it, here's the play. I think they're going to run the play. And so I just started running. And sure enough, 
Roger didn't even look. Staubach, cool as a cucumber, lines them up, bringing a man in motion from wide right to left. Staubach, double fake, drops back and throws down to the middle. Wagner's interception helped the Steelers take their first lead. As usual, they'd save their best for last. Bradshaw's back, he wants to throw. Now he fires for the ball, and Lynn Swan going for it. Swan holds it in for a touchdown! Lynn Swan beat his man on a bomb! Swan got a step beyond Mark Washington, who's been on him all afternoon! Swan's touchdown came at a heavy cost. I believe it was Larry Coles. Just as Terry released the ball, he stuck his helmet right in Terry's ear hole. And I see Terry down. I'm going, he's in the end zone? I'm going to run out there and see if Terry's all right. His eyes were kind of rolling around pretty good. He, he, he didn't have a clue what was going on. Bradshaw was forced to leave the game, which left the Steelers in a bind. A Dallas touchdown cut the lead to four. With backup quarterback Terry Hanratty in the game, Chuck Knoll made an unusual decision. On fourth and nine at the Dallas 41-yard line with a minute 28 left in the game, the Steelers ran the ball up the middle instead of punting, giving the ball back to the Cowboys near midfield. That's one of those situations where you say to yourself, what the heck, and then you go, oh, what the heck, this is great. You've basically just been told, I believe in you, and you guys are gonna win this game for us. You don't need any extra yards, just go out there and do your thing, is basically the message without it being said. With three seconds left, the Cowboys had one last chance. And he threw a ball down about the goal line, and it's in my direction. And it went off my finger, and then I panicked. And I came to the ground, and I looked back, and Glenn Edwards had caught it. I go, oh, thank God. And then he starts running out of the end zone. And I'm laying there going, What's he doing? Glenn, stop. Run out of bounds. Fall down. But there was nothing left to worry about and nothing more to prove. The Pittsburgh Steelers were Super Bowl champions again. The man who didn't think he could play became the first wide receiver ever named Super Bowl MVP. Last Super Bowl, I didn't catch anything. You know, in this Super Bowl, I caught three or four. I don't know, I caught three or four catches and... Uh, Hey, you know, I just loved it. Had a great time. All right, what is that you're holding right there? Uh, this is the uh, game ball for uh, the um, for the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's all mine. Lynn Swan, you were That back-to-back -back win legitimizes you as a champion. Now, what do you do for an encore? When well, you're ready for next year. Next year. <laughs> Even the second championship was not going to be enough. Uh, you know, the, the follow-up story to this one would be, you know, what happened the next year, the next year, and the next year. And, and this is probably what Coach Noel wanted, is the players, they realize that if you're a tomorrow person, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but it could bring some good things if you work hard to make tomorrow better. Tomorrow brought two more Super Bowl victories for Chuck Noel's Steelers the only team in history to win four Super Bowls in six seasons. Visit NFL.com slash America's Game for additional exclusive content for this episode and for a preview of number six on the countdown. The very first practice of Super Bowl 41 went down at the U. So, of course, Devin Hester probably felt at home for the Chicago Bears practice. 
as they get set for Super Bowl 41.